Well, good afternoon. I think in some capacity in this room, we recognize the environmental and social challenges that we face on a global scale. Now, what's interesting is what lies at the root of our global sustainability crisis is largely the impact of cities. Researchers are acutely aware that if we can, if we can fix the problems created by cities and the problems within cities, then we, we can reduce a host of the demands and challenges that we place on our global systems. Now, what are the problems with cities? Well, there are two sides to the coin. Cities produce a lion's share of the world's emissions, and they place a staggering level of demand on our global resources. As we heard earlier, cities can have ecological footprints hundreds and thousands of times larger than their actual geographical or footprint. At the same time, there are an array of battles that are being fought within our cities. Things like urban sprawl and the population influx that are straining resources, a dwindling economic base, all kinds of social issues, violence, and obesity, environmental degradation, including things like climate change effects now. These are real life present issues, and the lists go on and on, and they're threatening the quality, health, and even existence of our cities as we've seen in recent years. So these are the problems at the forefront, and decision makers are grasping for solutions. City officials, planners, require the most effective tools in their arsenal to be able to increase the permanence and resilience of our cities and our, and our global systems. So I'm here today to share with you an idea about an opportunity that we have to use something that already exists in this city, something that you encounter on the streets that you travel and in your own backyard, and it can be a significant force for change. Only, however, if we alter the value that we place on it. Now this is a piece of living green infrastructure. This is one of the most reliable, cost-effective, and efficient forms of living technology that we possess in our cities. I liken green infrastructure to good old-fashioned biotechnology because they've been around us for centuries, silently producing an array of goods and services that are helping the livability and the sustainability of our communities if they are managed appropriately. Now, with the advancements in spatial technologies, things like GIS, Geographical Information Systems, and with the increase in our understanding of benefits of green infrastructure, I think we have an incredible opportunity, like never before, to, to creatively showcase how urban ecology, and more specifically, things like our urban forests and urban trees, can be a significant part of the solution to the problems we find in our cities. So that's the journey we're on in the next few minutes. If there are two things you can take from this talk, I not only want to make a case for the importance of urban vegetation and ecology in our cities, but I want to present to you a research model on how we might use green infrastructure more potently and more powerfully within our communities as living technology to mitigate some of the biggest problems we find here. Now, green infrastructure, it's a wide definition. I'm referring to it today as natural living vegetation within our cities. However, it does include things like our green walls and green roofs but my focus is going to be on the heavy hitter, the urban forest and the urban trees, because I think in a minute you'll see why they are the star to the green infrastructure show. Now let me ask you a question. Why do we plant trees in our cities anyhow? Well, it's because they provide us with benefits. Now for centuries, cities have planted trees in their communities, primarily, however, for two reasons. One for their aesthetic benefit, and the other for their shade benefit. But the literature is piling up on our desks, and it's demonstrating an entirely, and demanding an entirely different way on how we need to be managing and seeing our green infrastructure in cities. The research is compelling us to see them as biotechnology because they're performing an array of services that we cannot engineer at that cost and um, far better than we could ever imagine. So as we see here, intermixed in these, uh, these plane trees, we have the linden species. And uh, what we see here with the linden is one of the top functioning air filters of our communities, and there's nothing else quite like it. They um, filter out some of the most health-damaging pollutants, such as ground-level ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide, some of the big killers in our cities. Now, a few months ago, the United Nations called for the maximization of urban forest benefits in light of the urban problems that we're now facing. The only problem is we don't have really much in our arsenal and, and how to do that. I faced this problem a number of years ago as a professional in the field where I was uh, privileged and responsible for prioritizing our municipal's green infrastructure investments, essentially where we should be putting our investments to plant trees and to maintain the trees that exist. 
Now, our mandate as professionals is to increase the benefits to the community, and I was very well aware of the literature that demonstrated the value of it to our community. But there was a problem. I had very little mechanism or model or means to actually understand how I could prioritize and allocate our limited funds that would give us the biggest bang for our buck in the community. There was a clear void in the literature and no models could help. So that was the motivating reason for me to return to school to develop smart greening, which is a research model and an approach to how we might actually maximize these benefits in our community. So let's take a minute and look at some of the benefits we actually do receive from this good old fashioned biotechnology. Well, there's a sizable body of evidence a sizable body of scientific evidence showing us that green infrastructure reduces energy by up to 15% for heating and up to 50% for cooling, depending on your location, and consequently reduces the need for power plants. Green infrastructure is also extremely effective, as we saw earlier with Jeff's presentation, at filtering uh, stormwater pollution, slowing and reducing storm peak, or peak, peak flows, and reducing the need for very expensive hard infrastructure that manages this water. Project, uh, pilot projects and case studies have demonstrated savings in the billions of dollars. Air pollution, we've all, are also talked about how trees are the active lungs of our cities. Green infrastructure also helps to reduce the urban heat island effect. Of course, there's all kinds of connections between energy consumption, public health, smog, smog levels, and greenhouse gas emissions. If we were to, to turn our attention towards uh, more of the biophys or some of the socioeconomic benefits, we recognize that work's been done 40 years ago that demonstrates that patients with access and views to green space are actually healing quicker and, and require less medication. There's a strong connection between child obesity and walkability, and of course, urban planning plays a big role in this. However, green infrastructure helps to increase pedestrian networks and encourage active transportation, primarily because it beautifies streets. It, it protects um, pedestrians from traffic. It slows traffic. It provides all these kind of networks of social and natural connections that are very important for human development. Now, this innate bond that we have with, with nature is what some scientists refer to as biophilia. And suggesting that it is now, maybe it's even hardwired into our DNA that we need to be in tune with nature. So urban ecology plays a big role in bridging this gap and satisfying this need and helping to benefit the health and development of urban dwellers. It also helps to give us that, that sense of, of place. There's also all kinds of connections between school performance and helping children cope with ADHD and the symptoms of ADD as well. And you know that smell when you walk into a forest? Researchers are just beginning to uncover the active medicinal aerosols of antifungal, anti, um, antiviral, and antibiotic agents that are pumped out in large quantities from our trees that help to clean and, and uh, hydrate the air that we breathe. Some have cancer-fighting properties, among other benefits. And if the right species are present, present in our cities, some are actually privileged enough to be bathed by these medicinal aerosols throughout the day. There's all kinds of connections between traffic calming, reducing stress, um, aggression, and crime rates, how there's positive affections between consumer behavior and the vitality of downtown cores. The list goes on and on, and in my research, I've, I've identified over 60 direct and indirect benefits that we receive from green infrastructure. The long and short of it is, green infrastructure has long been undervalued and underestimated until recently. The scientific evidence clearly demonstrates now that their benefits far outweigh their costs. Green infrastructure, it makes sense to have green infrastructure in our cities. Social, economic, and environmental sense. Now let me continue sharing why I feel green infrastructure can be so valuable for us. Let me explain it this way. This is hard infrastructure. This essentially, um, as, as light standards and, and benches, essentially has one function. Okay, sometimes an aesthetic function, function as well. So from here, we can receive a return on investment of, of uh, this type of hard infrastructure of about this much. And I'm using that as a surrogate for the benefits and services we receive from, inf from infrastructure. Now looking at green infrastructure, which is truly a remar remarkable multifunction, uh, multifunctional technology, one tree provides many of the benefits at the same time on the same site. So immediately, our return on investment skyrockets. Now, this is the potential we're dealing with when we're talking about green infrastructure. But herein lies the problem. We don't always have situations like this. Now, if this is the goal, and if, if this is what the United Nations is calling for, how do we go about maximizing the multifunctionality of trees and green infrastructure? Well, that was the challenge we were up against. 
Well, this is what scientists, managers, and foresters have been working with. Structure equals function. So essentially what we have here is the larger and the bigger the tree we have, and the more structure it has, so in the more leaf area, generally the more function we can receive and the more services or, or the return on investment. That's why tree healthcare is so important in planting the right tree in the right place. But my latest research has been designing, where I've been designing new ways to maximize the return on investment of trees. If we truly understand green infrastructure to, to have this exceptional and multifunctional trait, well then I think this moves us towards a groundbreaking paradigm. Find the sites that, find the geographical sites that allow trees to be as multifunctional as possible, and our return on investment goes through the roof. So there's a whole new spatial variable now to this equation. Using GIS and other spatial technologies, we have the ability to identify these multifunctional sites, as you can see here in the red. And as a quick example, a tree in the downtown core of a city provides exponentially more benefits than that exact same tree would on the outskirts of the city, simply because it's in a multifunctional site and it's providing those benefits that are readily realized by our community. This maintains the importance for trees in urban areas, especially, especially for cities like Thunder Bay, where we're surrounded by forests. So three years ago, my dream was to develop a community development tool that would take all the research that we see and figure out a way to actually, in the real world, maximize those benefits we see in the literature, spatially um, to, to, to realize that. Now, I not only wanted to do that, but I wanted to figure out a model that could actually help achieve the sustainability goals of a community. Things like reducing our carbon emissions, decreasing energy use, or increasing walkability. Those are the types of goals that I wanted to figure out how we could use green infrastructure for. So this was the goal, and I've been waiting three years to see if we could accomplish this. And I'm happy to share with you that we've successfully done it. So to get there, we embarked on a three-step process. We needed to know what the goals were of a community and where exactly they were struggling. So for the prototype case study for the city of Thunder Bay here, we actually had a chance to meet with decision makers, ran focus groups, and reviewed the guiding documents. That, in conjunction with a number of other processes, helped us to identify if and how green infrastructure could truly help meet our goals. By the end of it, I was absolutely convinced that no community strategic plan or official plan should be tabled without first considering and recognizing how our strategic investments in green infrastructure can actually move us much more rapidly towards our community goals. For instance, you're not intended to read all these, but this is just a, uh, a snapshot of the fraction of goals from our city's existing programs and plans that can in some way, shape or form be attained or furthered by the services rendered by green infrastructure. So what we do in these first two steps is we spend the time to pair the benefits with a community and identify which of the goals we need to focus on um, that, that connect with our sustainability pursuits of a community. And at that point, then each benefit is then spatially modeled. And as you see here, we have a map on the left-hand side. And what we do is we drop in the variables of the data that we require. So if we're looking at stormwater and looking at trying to figure out how do we reduce the stormwater problems with pollution and with um, the, some of the, uh, the flows, how do we do that? Well, when we look in, we bring down some of the data that looks at slope and looks at uh, uh, some, of the, some of the pollution sources and impervious cover. And on the right, then we can develop what we see here is a greening index that actually helps to mitigate that particular problem using green infrastructure. Helps us to understand where our investments need to go in the city. Now these maps are extremely helpful by themselves, but if you recall, we can't stop here. We need to continue to maximize the multifunctionality of these green infrastructure technologies. So what we need to do then is take all our green indices that we have for a particular area and merge them together to form a combined index. This is, what you s this is a, an output of the smart greening research model. It's um, various hotspot colors demonstrate where our investments need to be going in order to fulfill uh, a city's wide array of social, economic, and environmental goals. It gives us a breakdown of the various essential services uh, that are lacking in an area that can be satisfied by smarter types of greening. And it's also helping to determine the types of green infrastructure technologies that are required. If a particular area needs more of a, a green roof type technology or a, a green wall or urban forest or different types of um, green infrastructure technologies. And finally, it does help to provide an overall context and demonstrate to the community how valuable their own tree is on a larger scale. So I'd like to leave you with two things today. Next time you're out raking your leaves in your yard, 
or walking your street. Think about the living technologies that surround you. Consider how connected, how silent, and how multifunctional and powerful this good old-fashioned technology is, and how it's providing you and your household and your neighborhood and your city with immeasurable benefits. Researchers have been questioning whether the ecosystem services found in our cities will be able to handle the demand and of, of uh, the ever-growing urban developments. It is therefore vital that we continue to encourage our communities to optimize the ecosystem services that we receive from the urban forest and other green infrastructure technologies. If you're a decision maker here today, or community official, I urge you to encourage your communities to embrace green infrastructure in the paradigm we've seen today, and to ensure the services rendered by them are accounted for when guiding documents are developed. Now, by no means is this smart greening model the silver bullet to end all of our urban problems. But it is one community development tool that can, can, can help us strategically use green infrastructure like never before to help develop more livable, more healthy, and more sustainable cities. Thank you very much.